So I'm going to continue here um, with uh, tibial shaft fractures. Uh, you know, in the last talk we uh, went over uh, some techniques for uh, proximal tibia fracture fixation. I really didn't talk too much about plating, um, um, but that uh, is certainly an option as well for uh, extra-articular proximal tibia fractures. Really talk more about nailing and blocking screws and, and uh, techniques to uh, um, avoid uh, problems, and I'll, I'll get a, I'll get into that more when we uh, review the book chapter. Um, and uh, here we've been talking also about uh, minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis and uh, how you um, you know how you can address uh, distal fractures sometimes with plates. So how about reducing these indirectly? Right. So when you do minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis, you have to use indirect reduction techniques. So you got to get things out to length, right? And you can do that by plating the fibula, by using a distractor. Uh, you want to make sure you get your rotation, uh, both clinical and radiographic uh, rotation restored. And uh, you want to correct the angulation, you know, with bumps, with the distractor, um, with a properly contoured plate. Uh, with non-locking screws to sort of, you know, bring the bone to the plate. And if the plate is properly contoured, then it'll get the bone properly positioned. Now, if you're using the plate to reduce the fracture, it's got to be properly contoured, right? So if you put a perfectly straight plate down at the metadiaphyseal region, it's going to cause an angulation. So, you know, you use clamps, non-locking screws to bring the plate to the bone, the fragments will reduce to the plate. Now, if you're perfectly aligned because you're opened it and you have clamps, and now you put your plate and it's not perfectly sitting there, you can either bend it, or if it's a locking plate, you could just put locking screws in and make it like an internal fixator. Um, so here's a really old textbook here on uh, fracture reduction methods. Um, and so these are not new techniques, right? So using a properly contoured plate as a reduction tool, right? So if this is contoured the way you want it to, and you use cortical screws, here you see a tensioning device, uh, distracting the fracture, getting the butterfly in, and then loading this and compressing it, um, you know, that can help uh, reduce the fracture for you and, uh, and then compress it at the same time. So go through a few cases. Well, Here's a 21-year-old male, gunshot uh, injury to the distal tibia, acceptable soft tissue envelope. So what do you think? You know, you can nail this, plate this. I mean, it's pretty distal. In this case, uh, it shows plate fixation. You can see for additional stability, the fibula was fixed, highly comminuted. This was treated with a bridging technique and a pre-contoured plate. And I think the alignment is pretty satisfactory. You know, three months, you can still see it's trying to heal, uh, but it looks like it's, uh, you know, hopefully it's on its way there. Case two, 40-year-old diabetic female, low energy slip and fall. So diabetic, maybe a little more worried about uh, soft tissue problems. Acceptable soft tissues, so you look at it, you know, there's a fracture line perhaps coming down right about here. Um, possibly could nail this, in this case chose plate fixation again. Here you can see um, you know, percutaneous uh, uh, pointy reduction forceps to try and aid with the, uh, with the reduction. Already have a couple of screws in down here. And um, you, know, you can see with, without opening this with a minimally invasive uh, technique um, that you can get uh, good, clinical, uh, good clinical results and pretty good radiographic result there. And if I would go back, notice, you know, again, it's, it's a bridge plating technique of a comminuted fracture, and uh, in those cases you use very long plates, right? So you're using, you sort of, like in the AO they teach you, you're, you're treating it almost like you're doing a nail, like relative stability as opposed to absolute stability in, in a case of bridge plating. So what about this? Nail, plate, or X-fix? Really distal fracture. Uh, looks like there's an open wound. you got some bandages over here and over here. So, um, Pretty distal. I mean, it really looks like a case you, you're, you're tempted to plate. Um, but, um, you know, in my mind, I think that uh, I don't like plates right under these open distal tibia fractures, um, if you can avoid it. And this was a case where it's extra articular. It seemed that, uh, you know, the fibula's, uh, you know, not, uh, not too, too comminuted. And, um, you know, 
looks like we were able to get this. You got three screws down there and it maintains alignment and you see some bridging bone here. So when do you perform uh, MEPA? Well, um, you have to, you know, uh, oh, I'm sorry, when you perform MEPA, you have to make sure you uh, can do an indirect reduction, right? Um, these are uh, cases that um, uh, if you have a case that's maybe too distal for nailing, uh, you can do a minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. And um, I find that the, the prototypical case where it tends to work best is our comminuted distal extraarticular fractures. Because, you know, if you have a simple fracture, oftentimes you want to get those fractures anatomically reduced and compressed. Because if you don't, um, you, 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 and if you believe the strain theory, uh, then uh, that could be a very high strain situation. You put a locked plate, fracture is not anatomically reduced, um, and that may not heal well. Um, uh, but if it's, you know, in those cases, I think you have to open it, get them reduced. Whereas a comminuted fracture, um, those are the ones actually, uh, it's a low strain situation. You can use a bridge plating technique and that can work uh, with minimal invasive plating. So when not to perform MIPO? Well, um, if you have a real intraarticular fracture requiring reduction, so you've got to open it like a real pilon fracture as opposed to just some non-displaced fracture, or if indirect reduction cannot be performed, like it's just not possible, it's not working, you need to open it just to get it reduced. Um, and again, most B and C type fractures, intraarticular fractures that require reduction. Um, or what I showed in the last talk was a shaft fracture which can be nailed, you know what I mean? So if it's a, if it's a you know, tibia, distal tibia fracture, but it's really not that distal, it's, you know, diaphyseal. Um, and you can say the same thing for the proximal tibia, you know, something that's proximal, but it's not that proximal. Well, just do a nail and just use careful technique and, um, and you, should be, you should be fine as long as you can avoid uh, malreductions. So if you're going to do these, make sure you can reduce it, okay? Because the, 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 the um, uh, tendency is that if you're not careful with your reductions, you're not opening the fractures, you know, you're not seeing it, um, you, you can end up with more malreductions. So let the pre-contoured plate work for you. Uh, and if it's not contoured properly for that patient, because it's not always one size fits all, you may have to contour it yourself. Use long plates when spanning segmental combination. As I talked about, it's similar to like a relative stability like you do with a nail. And um, so that'll be it for this, uh, for, uh, this uh, conclusion of the tibial shaft uh, slides. In the next talk, we're going to go over um, uh, some of the uh, key points from the textbook chapter. Thanks.